we should stop for just a moment and reflect on not only how good God has been to us when things have been going great, but how good God has been to us when our life was a mess. For the most part, people go through life living out the image of what they want others to see in them when it comes to their relationship with their mate, their children, their family, their church. And they feel that by doing that and putting a Band-Aid on a wound that is so deep and so painful that they've covered up, they've masqueraded their deep inward hurts and heartaches. But when we fall in love with God, as the first commandment tells us to do, to love him with all our heart, all our soul, with the very depths of our inner being, when we do that, things will begin to fall into place. And we will no longer have to live the image of what we want others to see. We will no longer have to hide the pain that we don't want others to know we're experiencing. We will see ourselves being transformed into the kind of Christian that others will look at us and say, I want what you have. I am attracted to that in your life. And then you'll be able to share your testimony. And remember, your testimony, as I said last week, is something that you were tested and so severely tried in your life at some point, and somehow you got through it, that when you share it with others, they may be in total shock because they never thought that you went through something like that. When we get serious about our worship, when we get serious throughout the week to say, God, I am falling on my knees before you, and God, I need you in my life more than I've ever needed you, things will begin to happen. And when we come to church on Sunday, we are prepped and ready to experience the presence of God. You can pray anywhere, by the way. You can read your Bible anywhere you choose to read it. But you know what? When it comes to meeting God with other believers, this is the place. It's the church. It's the house of God. It's the bride of Christ that Ephesians chapter 5 tells us about. Husbands, love your wives. It's Christ that loved the church. And he gave himself for it. This is the institution. This is the place of worship. This is where Christians come and assemble to meet with God. Today we're going to talk about a word that for the most part some have a difficult time with. And that word is trust. If you have been in a bad relationship, you will say, it's hard for me to trust her. again. If you were speaking to me personally, you would say, you know something, Ron? We are working out our trust issues as a couple because when the trust seems to be broken, it appears as though there's no way to fix it. But with God, all things are possible and all things are fixable. All things can work together for God's good, according to Romans 8.28. But you have to have a heart that's fixed on God. You have to have a heart of worship. You have to have a heart that says, I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with that innermost being that God placed inside of me at conception. And when I learn to love God that way, then I can learn to love others the same way. And then I won't have the trust issues that I have. For the most part, trust issues are the result of an improper relationship with God. Trust issues stem from not having the image of God in your life that God so rightly deserves. And when we have the right image of God and we're fixed on God, then the trust issues will seem to work themselves out. Yet will 
I trust in God? No matter what goes on in my life, no matter how many times I face trust issues, I'm not going to focus on the person or the problem. I'm going to refocus my attention to God. Because if I expect to get victory over this trust issue, then I must have a proper view of who God is. And so in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, Habakkuk was called upon to truly trust God. He was placed in a situation where it was important that he was showing others that he trusted God. Verse 18. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He refocused his attention from the problem to the problem solver. And by doing that, he was making a statement. I'm not going to dwell on the problem. I'm not going to keep dissecting the problem over and over again. I'm not going to keep looking at the problem and becoming obsessed over the problem that's come into my life. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to rejoice in the Lord and I will experience the joy of the God of my salvation. Because in verse 19, we're told that the Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hind's feet, like a deer leaping over a fence, over a riverbed, up through a meadow, climbing high to the mountaintop. Habakkuk says, I am going to focus my attention so much on God, receive my strength from him, that when the hunter comes or the enemy comes, I'm going to be like a deer. I'm going to be like an antelope. And let me tell you this. No matter how frightened the deer is, the deer is still graceful when it runs away. There's nothing like watching a deer run through a meadow, up the side of a hill, no matter if it's being pursued by a predator or by a hunter or it's simply wanting to make its way to the mountaintop, it's still graceful as it runs away. That is our responsibility. As the enemy comes to us, as we experience those hurtful times in our life, we know that we can get away gracefully. He is my strength. To the chief singer on my stringed instrument, how does he come back? By experiencing the joy of his salvation through song. Now, there's a lady by the name of Corey Tenboom. And Corey Tenboom was taken captive at the Holocaust. And she could have had trust issues. And so she decided to focus her attention from the problem solver to. Now, she chose to es uh, escape by not focusing on the problem, but focusing on the problem solver. As a matter of fact, let's go to that slide, Jared. This definition of trust. is the idea of believing in something so reliably that nothing can separate us from the trust that we have. And, and as I said here in just a moment, Corey Ten Boom was a lady who put her trust fully in God, relied on him for everything that she had because she was a person who during the takeover by Adolf Hitler was one of the very few who took the Jews into her home and hid them from the Nazis. And because she did that, she was taken also prisoner and stood in front of a firing squad. And by the way, if you've not yet seen her movie, I would encourage you to do that. Because her movie is so It overwhelms me. Her movie is so intense that they show her standing in front of the firing squad. True story, by the way. She is standing there with the other prisoners, and the Nazis line up at about 50 yards away, and they take machine guns, and they begin to mow down the Jewish prisoners, and you can see them falling. 
into the pit that has been dug behind them. But Corey was not touched. When the enemy comes into our life, the enemy can't touch us. Because our trust is so fixed on God that the enemy shakes and trembles. And by the way, of all those definitions of trust, the bottom line is they all focus their attention to the cross. And only in the cross can we trust the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. It's right there. You have trust issues? Go back to the cross. You have issues that you're going through? The answers are found at the cross. Now we're going to look at the slide of Corey Tinboom. There's Corey later in life. And she lived by this statement of trust during her imprisonment in the Nazi camps. She said this, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Trust, if our testimonies are strong on this point, and if we feel the absolute assurance that God loves us, we will change our questions. We won't ask, why did this happen, or why doesn't God care about me? Instead, our questions will become, what can I learn from this experience? Or how does the Lord want me to handle this? Things are going to come into my life. Things are going to come into your life. And for a brief moment, the enemy's going to whisper in our ear, God's left you. God's forsaken you. God's left you alone. You're all by yourself. You can't pick up the phone. You cannot call the pastor. Why, you cannot call your parents. You cannot call a coworker. You cannot call a relative because you're scared to death at the information that you have to share. And you are afraid at that moment that this thing could destroy everything that you've lived for, everything that you've worked for. And the enemy says, I've got you right where I want you. And the truth is, we need to look at the enemy and say, you don't have me anywhere. My trust is based totally upon God. My trust is based in God, and it's all about God. And the God that lives inside of me is the God that's going to get me through all of this that I'm experiencing right now. Don't run. Don't hide. Give it to God. What are you going through right now? that you're experiencing some worries over. Right now, you have some things in your life that are trust issues. And you don't know what to do with it. You've tried to forget about it. You've tried to sleep at night. You can't. You wake up at all hours of the night. It's heavy on your heart. It's heavy on your mind. You don't know what to do with it. Maybe it's a financial pressure. Maybe it's a career change. Maybe it's a profession. Maybe it's family issues. I don't know. But whatever it is, you need to give it to God. The first thing that I want to share with you this morning about this idea of trusting in God is when we think about our American currency and we're told that as a Christian nation that we are to trust in God with everything that we have and that every time we go to spend any money at all from a penny thousands of dollars, we can look on that money and we find these words, in God we trust. The story is told of a guy who went to work for a man who was extremely wealthy. He was a billionaire. And his wife cautioned him on going to work for this billionaire. But he said, honey, I need to. He goes, we're connecting. I really like this guy. I like the company and I want to go work for him. After a, week's, um, uh, after a week of work, the boss came to him and he said, I'd like to take you and your wife out to dinner. He was excited. He came home, told his wife, and his wife said, I'm not good around people with money, and you know that. I, I'm going to have to go out and buy a new dress. I'm going to have to go out and get my hair done. And he, she's going through all these things that needs to be done in order to go out to dinner with the boss. He said, honey, he's just like, no, 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 you, those rich people, they're different than we are. They're, they live on this social level that I, I can't even comprehend. He says, well, nonetheless, we're going out to dinner. 
all week long she's spreading. She has this image of how arrogant this guy must be and how cocky he must be because people with money are just that way. That night, she's ready to go. And she asked her husband, honey, you go ahead and pull the car up and I'll get in. He said, no, honey, a limousine's picking us up. She's about to have a heart attack. She goes out, gets in the limousine, does her best to socialize, and um, the limousine pulls up to the gas station. And wouldn't you know it, the rich guy gets out because he noticed there was a penny on the ground. He picks it up, sticks it in his pocket. And she is beyond angry. All those feelings that she had about rich people. He hasn't made enough money. Now he's got to get outside, look down on the ground at the gas station, and pick up a penny. What a miser he is. And she's saying to herself, I'm going to confront him. I've had it. She does. Her husband is ready to die. So I have a question. Why did you go out and pick up that penny on the ground? It's not like you don't have enough money. And he said, well, here's what I do. I go out when I see money like that laying on the ground. I pick it up and I look at it because I always want to be reminded that it's because of God I'm where I'm at. And it's in God that I trust. It's not in my money. It's not in my wealth. It's not in who I am as a person. But I have everything that I have because I trust in God. And I take these pennies and I take these coins and I pay them forward. I give them to other people, and especially people that don't know that I own a business and own a company and that I'm wealthy. I hand these coins off to others and when they get those coins and they look at me and they say, thank you, sir, for the money, he says, it's not about the money. It's about in God that we trust. I don't know what you're going through again. I don't know what you're experiencing in your life right now. But I do know this, that we have to trust in God. And if you have to take a penny out of your pocket and set it somewhere in your home, when you're having a bad day, when you're having a day when your faith is fading, look at that penny, look at that nickel, look at that dime, look at that quarter, look at that 50 cent piece, put that dollar bill up and look at it and say, you know what, in God will I trust. The second thing that I want you to notice is this. I'm going to trust in God no matter what happens to me. Though friends may betray me, though friends may forsake me, I'm going to trust in God. A few years ago, there was a shooting at Columbine High School. Who would have ever thought that one of those students would have walked into Columbine High School and open fire on the student body. Who would have thought that the airwaves would have been filled later that afternoon with shooting at Columbine High School by a student? No one would have ever imagined that. No one would have believed that. And there were those who were saying, I trusted my classmates. I trusted my friends. I never thought this would happen. What about in Chardon High School just a few months ago? Another student went in there with a gun and began to open fire on the student body and some of the faculty. It is beyond me that we've reached that place in American society that we have to live in fear of young people going to school. One of the uh, procedures I had to do when I was principal at the Talmadge Christian Academy, or over in Talmadge, of course, is when the police officer showed up and he asked me if we had done our lockdown drill yet. You have to understand, I was not familiar with the lockdown drill. I wasn't thinking. I had just gotten back into education after some absence. And I said, well, what's a lockdown drill? He says, well, you should know. And he's right. I should have known, but I didn't. And he begins to tell me that the lockdown drill is in case someone comes in from the outside with a gun or a knife or with some type of bomb, and wants to hold the student body or the student faculty hostage, there has to be a procedure in which the children are taken to safety. I was shocked. Maybe I'm a dinosaur. 
yes, I knew about Columbine, but I thought that's there and this is here and this is a private school and we shouldn't have to worry about that. He said, you don't know, the officer said to me, you don't know which student may snap. You don't have a clue. When things go wrong in your life and things aren't as you want them to be and you're having a hard time with the trust issue because someone has robbed you of your joy or your happiness, what do you do with that? On a bigger level, we have shootings, trusting one another in, in, in the classroom, trusting the faculty to take care of the students. What about just a few weeks ago in Colorado where the young guy, young boy went in at the midnight showing and decided to open fire in the movie theater? Wow. Is it not safe to go outside? Is it not safe to even let our children play outside anymore? Is it not safe to send them off to school? Trust issues. Beware of your Judas. You don't know who they are. It's been said that Judas himself, the very Judas of the Bible, the betrayer, interestingly enough, sat with Jesus, knew all about Jesus, and as one theologian said, kissed him on the cheek or kissed the doorway to heaven, but yet never came to know him personally. And he committed suicide as a result of not trusting in Christ to be a savior. We need to know our betrayer. We need to be aware of who our enemy is. And by the way, spiritually speaking, I'm not your enemy and you're not mine. We fight a greater cause than this. Next thought that I want to share. Is those circumstances overwhelmed me? Yet, Will I trust in God? Stress is now the number one killer, the number one reason that Americans are having heart attacks. They're overwhelmed. I am overwhelmed. Those circumstances overwhelm me. We allow those things in life to get to us in such a way that they burden us down. Maybe a son or a daughter has, has kind of slipped away from how they've been taught and they're hanging with friends and that you're not happy with mom and dad and, and, and they know that in their heart. They know they're with the wrong person because if you've trained them well and you've raised them right, deep down inside of their heart, they know that things aren't right. And as that may overwhelm you as a parent and as that may cause you to lose sleep at night, Remember, there's one who can take care of those things which overwhelm us. You know, Ron, someone said to me, I'm scared to death. My son is going to be five years old, and I'm thinking about sending him off to kindergarten, and I'm not only in fear of disconnecting with my little boy going into kindergarten, but I am in fear of the environment by which that little boy may be placed in. And what kind of parent would I be knowing that I ship my child off to school and maybe they're not going to be taught the way that I want him to be taught? Or maybe the janitor or the teacher or someone, there's a predator, scared to death, overwhelmed with decisions that have to be made. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm raising my kids the best I can. They want to go to college. I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. Or my kids are making decisions I'm not happy with. And they're overwhelmed. I hear it all the time. Some people are overwhelmed. I want more out of life. I, I want more than what I, I, I'm experiencing right now in my personal life. Things aren't as they're supposed to be. I am so overwhelmed. I wake up in the morning with stress. I live with stress throughout the day. I go to sleep at night stressful, and I don't know what to do. Life is overwhelming me. No matter how much money I make, there's not enough money to pay the bills. No matter how much I love my husband, it seems like it's not enough. No matter how much I love my wife, it seems like it's not enough. No matter how much I love my kids, it seems like it's not enough. I am so overwhelmed. I want to do more for God than I've ever done, but I am so overwhelmed. When you're overwhelmed, you should be saying, I'm going to trust God. Let me tell you something. I get overwhelmed. There have been times in my life when I didn't think I was going to get through the day. 
There have been times when I thought I couldn't make it another day. Students are going back to school, of course, and for those who are going to step up their walk with God, there's a lot of pressure placed on them right now because they know that they want to do right, live right, but for the most part, well, that's a tough thing to do, especially when your peers will forsake you and they will betray you. The peer pressure can be overwhelming. The next thought that I want to share with you is this, and this is the last thought. Though God may test me to promote his kingdom, I will succeed. I will trust him in all things. One of the things that um, is familiar to me anyway when I gave a test to the students when I was teaching school was I put a little sign outside on the door that says, do not disturb, testing. I wanted the students to focus in on what they were doing. I didn't want there to be any distractions. I didn't want there to be any noise. And believe it or not, sometimes I would dim the lights because fluorescent lighting, you know, can be distracting. And I did the best to make, I did my best to make the atmosphere the best that I possibly could so that they could stay so focused and do well on their test. Let me ask you this. When someone's being tested spiritually, and you know they're going through a rough time, when someone is being tested emotionally, physically, how do we respond to that? Do we make their life better for them? Or are we like the friends of Job who point the finger and think we know what the best answer is for their life, their problems, their hurts, their heartaches. Why are they going through this? Or do we allow their time? We do, or do we allow them their time to take their test peaceably, where they can focus, where they can think? When we're being tested as Christians, it's so important that we allow God to do the work in that person necessary, so that He can bring them to the place in their life where they're better than they've ever been. Here's what I would have done if I would have been living during the time the prodigal son left home. Most likely, I would have been the guy that would have interfered with God's testing of the prodigal son. Most likely, I would have been the guy when I saw him take his head and place it in that pig trough and begin to eat the slop that the pigs were eating because he was so hungry, I probably would have pulled him out of that and said, come home with me. And maybe God would have worked that out to be okay. I don't know. But you see, once he dipped his head in the pig's trough, the prodigal son came to his senses and he says, I must go home. I must go home. How low? Are we going to have to stoop as a country, as an army of believers, as Christians, before we finally look to God and say, God, I'm coming home. I don't want to see one of my classmates die before I do the right thing. I don't want to experience so much hurt and so much heartache that that is what it took for me, for God to get my attention. But through all of it, no matter where you're at in life, no matter what you're going through right now, and for the most part, God is in the testing business. God tests me, he tests you. Though God may test me to promote his kingdom, I will trust in God. Boy, as the middle picture so clearly states, we wake up every morning, we're at the crossroads in life. We wake up, we don't know which direction to turn, we don't know which way to go, because we're so overwhelmed with the day. Went to bed with stress, woke up with the stress, woke up with so many things on our mind. Speaking to a guy this, this week, and family member, and here's what he said. He said, you know, Ron, I try to go to bed early but even if I do, I still wake up an hour later not being able to sleep. Then I 
go to bed later because I thought just maybe if I'm so tired when I fall asleep, I won't wake up, but I do. I'm getting no sleep. I'm filled with worry. I'm filled with anxiety. I'm overwhelmed. I'm not a very pleasant person to be around anymore because of what I've become. And I don't like the person that I've become. I'm overwhelmed. I pointed him to Jesus. And that's who I'd like to point you to today. Jesus, the Savior of the world. Jesus, the Savior of our souls. If you've not yet made a profession of faith in Christ, you've not yet put your trust in him, I want you to do that. Habakkuk said, it doesn't matter. Though I get tested and tried, I'm going to trust in God. And that's what I want you to do this morning, if you would. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Jamie's going to come and lead us in a song of invitation. And as she does, I'm going to ask that you respond accordingly. When you think about where you're at right now in your life, can you say, Ron, in spite of it all, I know that I know that I know Jesus is guiding me through the whole thing. Though there are times I'm stressed and overwhelmed, I do, Ron, trust in God. Or maybe you would say, you know something, Ron, as a Christian, I've lost my trust in God. I'm one of those Christians that can be clearly defined uh, as of, oh, ye of little faith. We're going to give an invitation, and then I'm going to invite you to come. And for whatever reason, maybe you need to come and spend some time in prayer because there's something personal in your life that you really need to pray about. Maybe you need to come during this invitation and pray for others whatever it may be. Maybe you're having trust issues. I don't know. Maybe you've never became a Christian. Today is the day that you could become one. Let's all stand to our feet with our heads bowed for just a moment. Father, the invitation belongs to you. I'm going to ask, Father, that you use this invitation, Father, to accomplish your will and what it is that Father needs to be done today. So, Father, it's my prayer that as we sing this invitation song, that, Father, the trust issue would be settled. And that, Father, we would place our trust in you, the problem solver, and focus in on you and not the problem. May we be like Corey Ten Boom and say, no matter what, no matter what, no matter what the unknown may be, I'm going to trust in a God who knows my future. And even though, Father, she could have been killed, she stood there. And God, you protected her. And you'll protect us too, no matter what we're going through. May we drop the image of what we want people to see and become truly, Father, who we are in you. May we finally get peace in our lives, Father. May those who are experiencing issues with trust, Father, may they take these issues to you and may they give them totally to you this morning. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.